Thank you, Dr. Chandrasekhar, and thank you, Dr. Raja Rao. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank and acknowledge many of the senior physicians here. In fact, probably this hall is filled with uh, the top physicians of Telangana, and I'm glad or happy that they could make time to be here with us this morning for this uh, very important topic, which I believe is something that uh, in clinical practice, almost, as I said before, 20 to 30 percent of the patients are constituted. Now, again, as a physician, you may ask me, what's the point of endoscopic management? Because it doesn't concern you at all. If anybody requires endoscopy, you send off to the gastroenterologist. So is there any meaning in knowing about that? So before I start that, let me tell you a small story. Story of these two gentlemen, Albert Einstein, everybody knows. One of the world's, in 1940s, he was considered the world's most cleverest man. Of course, Nobel Prize, so on and all. But in general, he's considered the cleverest person in the last, decade, last century. Beside him is Professor Rodolphe Nyssen. Nyssen, uh, everybody knows Nyssen surgery, fundoplication, the world's best GRT surgeon in 1940s. This is an interesting story between, because they were both very close friends. And Albert Einstein used to have severe reflexes. In fact, an opportunity to visit his uh, hometown and uh, museum he saw, he used to get severe reflexes. And he used to keep taking antacids at that time, there were no PPIs. So Rudolf Nissen once went to him and told uh, Albert Einstein, because of close friend, I will do surgery on you to cure your problem. So Albert Einstein refused. He didn't want to. Because everybody is frightened of surgery. So he said, no, no, I don't want the surgery to be done. He continued his antacids and he died in 55. And when he died, a postmortem was done, mainly not for doing, for, mainly because they wanted to have his brain. What is this fellow having such in and in the postmortem, they found that actually his symptoms are not because of reflex. Esophagus was all right, but he had an abdominal aortic aneurysm and severe coronary artery disease, which was mistaken for reflex and died. And because of that, he finally died. So this story tells us three things. First, even the cleverest person on the world can make mistakes regarding his own health. When the best surgeon in the world is offering him surgery, he refuses. Actually, if he had accepted that, if they had worked him up for surgery, they would have found aneurysm, angiogram, everything would have been found. Probably would have been living a little longer. The second important thing is that reflex is a great mimicker of many diseases. Aneurysm in his case, coronary artery disease in his case, and subsequently it will be discussed, I think, uh, by my colleagues, how it can very close resemble. So it can be a very close uh, mimic. And the third is, I think we should start uh, very carefully looking at alternative methods of treatment in patients uh, who are not responding to conventional treatment. So these are very important lessons we learned from this story. Again, something non-endoscopic, but I'd like to emphasize, re-emphasize this very, very important point that when you have patients with GERD, just kindly don't treat them as GERD. The simple, uh, Way of practice I'd like to tell you about after about 40 years of practice in gastroenterology to simplify it. If you have a patient below the age of 40, 40 years and has symptoms of GERD, just put him on PPI antacids and Zaid has given a brilliant, brilliant lecture on that. Just put him on that. If he's responding, keep it for four weeks and then stop and so on. I mean, as a gastroenterologist, I'm telling you not to send them for endoscopy below that age. And this may sound a little paradoxical, but that is true. After the age of 40 years, kindly send after the age of 40 years, or if they have any alarm symptoms like dysphagia, anemia, melina, melina kindly send them for endoscopy. Don't uh, neglect, not because gastroenterologists profit from this, but because these patients will definitely benefit from a workup. So just give a landmark. Below 40, treat with PPS. Above 40, plus alarm symptoms, kindly send for endoscopy. Endoscopy will clearly tell you whether you're dealing with the first category, erosive reflex, which is what we mean by GERD normally. If it's erosive reflex, easy, just start on PPS and everything that Zahir has told you about. If it is not erosive reflex, but endoscopy is normal, so we call it non-erosive reflex. Now, in these patients, there is acid reflex, but they don't have any esophageal damage, so endoscopy will be normal. This is the largest category of patients we see. If you take 100 persons, 100 patients with GERD, 
around 70 to 75 percent will fall into this category. They don't have anything on endoscope. This is what we see. And you'll also be surprised in practice, patients complaining of heartburn, you send for endoscopy, report will come back normal. Sometimes gastroenterologists, just to please the referring physician, will write some few erosions there, gastritis or something like that. Don't take that seriously. Most of the time, it's normal. The cause of uh, this is something else. So something else is first category is non-erosive reflex disease, which we can make out by what Rakesh told you nicely about pH impedance and so on. But the most common, 60% of the patients belong to this category of so-called functional heartburn. Now, again, don't get confused by these two categories, reflex, hypersense, functional heartburn, reflex, all mean same thing. That's a functional disease. These patients don't have any disease. It's like IBS. So endoscopy will just rule out erosive gastritis. So very simple in clinical practice for you. If you have a patient above the age of 40 years showing erosions, keep the patient to treat with PPIs and do everything that has been told. But if the patient is below, um, above 40 years, but does not have anything on endoscopy, kindly send him for a further workup to the gastroenterologist to get this workup done to classify him into these categories because the treatment is dramatically different in each category. I've seen patients with functional heartburn on PPIs for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Some of them have some side effects also, and then nothing happens. They keep taking, they feel better. Placebo effect, they feel better. And then that goes on and on. So I think it's very important to remember that. And also important to remember that, like it was discussed earlier, that many of us will have some amount of heartburn, especially if you go and eat a very heavy meal. I hope it's not so heavy this afternoon, but if you go and eat a very heavy meal, then you'll develop a little reflex. Then what we suggest is uh, alginate that uh, uh, Zai told you about. You don't have to put a, take PPIs for long term. So in clinical practice, GERD is very simple or very complicated, depending on how you look at it. So keep it very clear, very easy. Take this age group as a dividing point. Send for endoscopy after this age group. If it's erosive, keep with you. You can treat the patient. If it's non-erosive functional, then this patient requires to. So don't go on giving PPIs for long term without actually assessing these patients. So that is the role of endoscopy in terms of diagnosis in these patients. So what, what about, uh, so this, uh, this spectrum is important to know. And the whole emphasis for this morning's conference is to tell you that this spectrum is there. That is right from erosive esophagitis to so-called functional disease that occurs. If you just get this one message and go off today, that's enough. Nothing else is required. So now most patients, as I said, are treated medically. There's very little role for us and for endoscopic therapy or surgical therapy. But there is a little concern here. You see patients taking, and this has been raised several times, both from the chair and from the audience, long-term effects of side effects of PPI. So Zahi told you about how people, uh, there's they no very strong evidence for many of these, like renal problems, interstitial nephritis, bone problems in elderly males, uh, dementia, and so on. But remember, that even if they exist in 1% of the patients, that is sufficient, big enough. In fact, there was a recent, uh, about two years back, there was an article which uh, discussed in the lay press. Uh, this was came in one of the British tabloids about Alzheimer's disease linked with PPI. Now, Alzheimer's is so common, PPI taking is so common, so there'll be some link somewhere. Somebody statistically showed a link, and immediately you won't believe that 30% of the population in Great Britain, you were taking PPI, stopped it. Because this affects the psyche so much. So we have to be cognizant of the fact that people are aware because so many Google doctors now, they're aware that these effects are there, they won't take it. Second is PPIs are good, but there's one category of patients I want to, which has not been discussed so much, is patients who have large volume reflux. And this is again something all of us can experience if we have a heavy meal sometimes, but even without that, Sometimes what happens is you have a large volume reflex. So heartburn is one, regurgitation one. But this large volume regurgitation is very stressful. So if you're getting into your mouth, some acid contents coming out, these are the people with large volume. And these people don't respond so well to PPI. It's important to remember that group who don't respond. And there, of course, as I said, the many who are reluctant to take. Very rare hypersensitivity groups are there. Generally, PPI doesn't cause hypersensitivity, but rare group of people who are reluctant to take PPI. So this group, again, we don't have any other form of therapy. And of course, a very small group, non-responsive to PPI. In all these categories of so-called 
unmet needs, there's something has to be done. Now, this is, I put this slide up just to show you that there are so many adverse events which have unproven casualty. If you take the very strong signs and look at them, you may not have a casualty. Uh, only the ones with a little dark yellow actually have been shown. For example, it has been shown that people can develop for uh, recurrent GI infections. So this is again very common clinical practice. Patients will come and tell you, I've been taking PPI for heartburn and I'm getting uh, recurrent uh, diarrhea. And whenever I eat out, I get diarrhea. This is because the bacterial flora changes completely. Long-term PPI, this is something that has not been studied very well, but you should be aware that if you take long-term PPI, your gut microbiome changes. And gut microbiome controls everything in our life now. So there is unknown. This has not been studied. A lot of studies are going on. We will we'll know the long-term effect a little later. So gut microbiome changes. So these things should be aware, you should be aware of. And also this yeah, very interesting study, which came, we showed that uh, actually uh, there is some evidence. We used to think PPI, you no know, gastric cancers and all not related. There's some casual association in Western countries with H. pylori. So a combination of H. pylori, PPI and gastric cancer seems to be linked. So it should not be altogether taken out. So therefore, in GERD, there are some unmet needs to the current treatment, the refractory GERD, the long-term PPI use, avoid anti-reflex surgery, and those who have volume reflex. In these unmet patients, there is an indication for endoscopic therapy. So you see how this has come to, but although I'm speaking for endoscopic therapy, I'd like to again emphasize, it's a very, very small percentage of patients, less than 1% of the patients who ultimately require. But endoscopic therapy is now becoming so easy, so effective, and so safe, that maybe we should start rethinking whether putting these patients on 10 years of PPI, we should shift them to this very simple non-invasive technique, which is very often done as outpatient in our departments. But before I get to that, there's something very unhappy that happened with endoscopic therapy. This was in, nine, in 1990s. Because GERD was such a big market, everybody came up with different endoscopic therapies. It's called endosage, Entrix, and so on. All of them failed because they didn't undergo rigorous randomized control trials, and they went into graveyard of medical procedures. In 2010, it was believed that there's no endoscopic therapy for GERD, only medical treatment or surgical treatment, that's all. But then in the last 10 years, a new evolution has occurred. And this evolution is actually this, uh, summarized in this very good article that uh, I wrote with Zahir for clinical endoscopy. And now we have three basic techniques of how we can actually treat these patients endoscopically, those who have the so-called unmet needs I talked about, volume, reflex, and so on. The first is the straight-up procedure, very simple. Again, I won't go into too much of the details of the procedure because, so what we do in strata is a very simple technique where this is a balloon mounted with uh, needles. We pass it endoscopically, and this can be done even by a physician, so simple. We put it inside and then these needles actually go into the muzzle of the esophagus and we burn the muzzle with radio frequency uh, energy, so thermal energy. And what this does is it actually burns the low muzzles, a very safe procedure. And majority of these patients, uh, the lower esophageal spinter area gets remodeled. And uh, their response uh, is, uh, this is what endoscopically it looks like afterwards. Now, there was a meta-analysis which showed so one of the impressive things of meta-analysis is the tables like this, you know, so to impress upon the audience that there's a lot of science involved in this. But just to summarize what is, this is that and the conclusion was strata improves subjective and objective clinical endpoints in patients who have very mild GERD. So those who come in the category of grade A, NERD, would be the candidates who would get this type of therapy done. So don't suggest this therapy for patients with severe if you have erosions on endoscopy and all, we don't do this therapy, only for very, very mild patients. So I think uh, in the audience, many of you have mild GERD. This is what can be done if you don't want to take long-term PPS. Very simple procedure, no side effects. Now, the second procedure is more interesting, more semi-surgical, which is called uh, transoral fundoplication. Basically, what happens in GERD, and this has been told to you about pathophysiology by Neeraj, is that acid and food is coming into the esophagus and not going down properly. So if you can close the lower esophageal spinter, 
it could be done only surgically earlier rohit is going to talk about that but now it can be done medically endoscopically this is again a very simple procedure this is a actually a device uh, which we were involved me and rakesh were involved in developing this is called the gerdex device pass through endoscopy and i'll just show you how it's done because very simple in fact this morning we thought we'll demonstrate to you but we didn't have the time for the lecture this is passed through the mouth and through the endoscope we can see what we're doing you see this is the two jaws are coming out and these two jaws will go and uh, produce a stapling device which can close the lower esophageal sphincter so you see how it closes it closes there and it decreases the size of lower esophageal sphincter it's a very very simple procedure it can be done as a outpatient very often and you can see very nicely how we have produced a pseudo valve at the lower esophageal junction so food and acid does not go inside so this is a device which is uh, i believe going to revolutionize the treatment of uh, gastroenterologists endoscopically in fact this is the first study on this published uh, this year from our unit in a in a journal called gut which is one of the highest impact and like medical people have new england journal of medicine we have the gut for gastroenterology and you can see in this study that when we looked at the quality of health uh, in patients who had this gerdex followed by those who had sham so this was a true randomized study and unless you do a true randomized study you can't prove a point and this is a true randomized study we showed that quality of health improves and most importantly both regurgitation and heartburn comes down completely and regurgitation is again very important so if you have a volume regurgitation you give ppis they don't respond but you do this procedure regurgitation comes down and most important part of this very dramatic was that at the end of one year when we see the red line shows those who had gerdex done 70% of them stop ppis and we have been discussing about long term ppis efficacy and i think vijay pointed out to this people getting addicted to long term ppis so this stopped completely we stopped ppis whereas only in 30% in a sham procedure we could stop ppis so the important aspect of this procedure is that long term ppis are not required in this patient the third procedure just briefly to show is something that we as endoscopists do that is what we do is a very novel procedure again this is something we have been involved with a japanese doctor called haru inoi that around the g junction we create a defect and that defect uh, can be uh, causing secret resistance of g junction so we produce a burn injury again in outpatient procedure around the g junction so ultimately you see what happens is because of these white areas are all the burn injury and you can see in this last uh, slide that uh, this patient produces scarring here so that the g junction becomes small so this is how it technically done but may not be too important for you but this is called the arma procedure that is um, anti reflex mucosal ablation it's got a nice name but again a very simple procedure it can be done in people are reflex so therefore you can see there are at least three good procedures very simple procedures which endoscopists can do in patients who don't respond to uh medical treatment who don't want to take long term medical treatment or afraid of surgery surgery still has a role again in a very small group of patients rohit is going to talk about that especially if you have a large hiatus hernia too much of volume reflux again ultimately surgery has to be done but in a small percentage this is a very good so i think this is just to summarize that a small percentage of patients are not satisfied with ppi therapy because they don't want to take lifelong therapy they have incomplete relief of symptoms uh, and of course uh, because there is some amount of fright morbidity associated with surgery they want endoscopic uh, therapy and for these patients endoscopy is actually emerging a very promising alternative again as physicians you need not know the details about it just to tell you that a small percentage long term pps can be stopped with endoscopic therapy thank you for your attention